I wanted to clear up a few things uh, that have come up in the conference so far uh, when Dr. Salerno was talking about uh, fear of deflation or defl def deflation phobia. He mentioned that I had coined this term. Um, that's supposed to be an A there, but it, it's more authentic. Um, in order to coin a, a, a fear, an official psychological fear, I learned that you um, use the name of whatever the person is afraid of in Greek, and then you add phobia. And so I knew this, uh, uh, this person who had helped me out in the past who was a Greek translator, an academic, um, and so forth, and he had helped me out in the past. And so I emailed him and asked him to give me the translation for deflation phobia. A couple days later, I figured, you know, you could get it right off the tip of your tongue, uh, but it turns out there's really not a word in Greek for deflation. Apparently under the, uh, in the Greek society, they either had stable money or inflation. Um, and he sends me back this, apop lit phobia. And so I tried to start breaking that down. Obviously, phobia is the fear of. And so I figured it was a pop in the price level. Um, <laughs> and so I sent him back my, my uh, sort of retranslation. And uh, he said, no, that's not quite it. Um, there was no term for deflation, so he had to sort of make something up, uh, which didn't mean anything. So he wrote me back and said, no, it really means this, which was just a series of Greek symbols, um, which, again, didn't help me very much. Um, and this guy had been helpful in the past. Uh, a friend of mine who is Greek uh, had put me on to him a number of years before when um, I had sort of been pushed into politics, into running for office. And I was a little intimidated by that being a... Yankee New Yorker uh, coming down to Alabama and being sort of pushed into the political realm. And so I've been asking my friends for advice, and my Greek friend recommended I um, contact his cousin, the Greek translator, uh, to get to the very basics of what politics was. And so I asked him to, uh, to translate that for me. And... Uh, this time he came back and he said, well, you know what, in Greek, what poly means? It means many or several. And I said, yeah, polynumerals and all that kind of stuff. He says, you know what ticks are? And I said, well, I don't know what that means. He said, well, they're a bunch of infectious, blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> and so politics um, at that point became very clear to me. Another thing I wanted to uh, clear up my uh, really brilliant point that I was going to make the other day doesn't seem quite as momentous as at, at this point, but it was on Nick's good question about um, the lack of development in Africa, where you know it's, it's put forward that there was just an absence of capital rather than the rule of law, as Nick pointed out, and I'm sure Murray would would agree with him at that point. Um, on that point, but you have to remember, and this is again a good lesson about man, economy, and state, and how it's actually structured. Um, first of all, there's lots of reasons, possible reasons, for the lack of capital, including the rule of law. Um, but there's also simply that people don't have a preference uh, for putting it for savings and, and building up capital. Uh, they might have a particular um, ideological bias against accumulating uh, capital, and they prefer to live, um, you know, in thatch huts and very little clothing. Uh, you can think of the Survivor, you know, TV shows, uh, people like that, or just some sort of religious bias against accumulating capital, um, such as we might find in Tibet. So there are lots of natural reasons for the absence of capital. But, of course, at this part in Man, Economy, and State, Rothbard is assuming that we have uh, a free society with the rule of law. 
based on libertarian property rights based uh, system so that he naturally wouldn't uh, bring into focus the absence of the rule of law at that particular point. Okay, with respect to uh, triangular intervention, uh, Rothbard first, uh, of course, lays out autistic intervention where the state is um, coming to you as an individual and intervening in your lives in some way. And then uh, what is to follow this lecture on binary intervention where the state, again, uh, intervenes in your life in the form of uh, taking away your property um, taxing you, uh, requiring that you provide the state with certain gifts. And then there's triangular intervention, where the state intervenes between transactions and exchanges, uh, between various individuals and business forms out there in the economy. And so that's going to be the, uh, the focus of this lecture. One of the questions that was raised, uh, with respect to this chapter was, you know, what is Rothbard's contributions here? Because a lot of the actual interventions that he goes over um, are familiar to some economists, or some of them are uh, familiar to many economists. But the overall basic topology of interventions that Rothbard provides in Man, Economy, and State is a contribution. Um, it's a contribution that, that he lays out the whole extent, not comprehensive, but gives you the full extent of the types of government interventions that do exist, and then breaks them down into categories. So that's a, that's an, a, a contribution, and also it uh, gives you a good flavor for single triangular interventions, and then when you look at the whole broad base of triangular interventions, it gives you uh, an understanding of how chaotic a market economy can become when you have each and every one of these uh, interventions as well as many others. And then, of course, as Walter pointed out, um, it, it also gives you, a, looking back, it gives you a good picture of what the free society really is. Because in the absence of all these interventions, including de things like defense, uh, you get a good picture of what society is. So he is laying out an understanding of society to begin with in man, economy, and state, and then bringing in all of these uh, interventions. And, of course, what he's pointing out is that these interventions um, reduce social welfare. Uh, they cannot increase social welfare. They only decrease it. Triangular intervention is what most economists think of when they think of intervention. Regulations, price controls, things of that nature. And so these are a lot of the most common types of interventions that we see in the real world. Um, with respect to autistic and binary, uh, autistic and binary types of interventions people generally understand. They see them and they understand them. You know, if you were forced to salute uh, to the flag or you're forced to salute uh, to the ruler or to the Fuhrer, um, you know, you would have a good idea of how that made you feel personally. If you are forced to pay taxes or somebody repossesses your home because you failed to pay taxes, you get a pretty good idea of how that impacts you. But triangular intervention <coughs> is where there's a veil of ignorance, where we don't really see and feel the impact of intervention in our daily lives. And so this is the area where economists can be most enlightening to the general public. It's only people who can see the unseen, in other words, that actually can enlighten their fellow citizens with respect to what is the impact of this price control, or conversely, what is causing a shortage of a particular uh, good or service, or what is causing the price of a particular product going up? Where are those causes? Well, the normal, average, ordinary, everyday, common person doesn't have any way of figuring those things out. 
And if you listen to the major media, uh, they really don't have much of a clue either. It's up to each and every one of us to be able to provide that kind of insight to our fellow uh, citizens. The first type of intervention is uh, price controls, um, where you have where the government sets a, either a minimum price, such as a minimum wage, or a maximum price, such as a usury law setting an upper limit on the interest rate. And you can also have uh, a fixed price of a particular good. Uh, you can have the state coming in and fixing all prices across the board. And so there's a variety of different types of price controls that the state imposes. Uh, Rothbard focuses on effective price controls, those where the uh, price setting, uh, minimums, maximums, or fixed prices um, are at odds with reality, with economic reality. Uh, and these cause, these cause distortions in the economy, surpluses and shortages. They cause uh, businesses to lose money, entrepreneurs to lose money, and they lower welfare in the economy. And of course, um, there's the general price control, which we see imposed by states in, in highly inflationary economies, and hyperinflationary economies with the idea to prevent inflation uh, from impacting uh, economic performance and to prop up the purchasing power of money. Of course, this um, the general price control is actually uh, causes a lot more chaos, a lot more distortions and losses uh, in the economy. Uh, money seems to lose uh, an anchor to value. Uh, businesses uh, lose money, and entrepreneurs have a very difficult time uh, calculating. One interesting thing that Rothbard does here with respect to price controls is that he brings in price controls on money. Okay, So where normally you would find things like Gresham's Law, legal tender laws, in chapters on monetary economics and monetary policy, uh, Rothbard introduces them here in terms of price controls. So he explains um, bimetallism in Gresham's Law, where good money supposedly drives out bad money by categorizing um, bimetallism, where the state fixes the ratio of gold to silver as a form of price control. Legal tender laws. Um, have a lot of different effects, but Rothbard focuses in on the, the impact of legal tender laws on brand new coins versus worn out coins. And finally, usury laws, which are often uh, looked at in terms of price controls, where the state imposes maximum interest rates in order to keep rates low. Of course, this prevents loans, it prevents, uh, discourages savings and investment, and ultimately leads to extra market activity, uh, such as loan sharking, where uh, individuals work outside of the normal market channels. Uh, they charge extremely high rates of interest. Uh, because the normal rules of, of law in the marketplace aren't in place it, with illegal activity, it introduces yet another form of violence. So the violence of the state coming in and imposing its rule with respect to interest rates also uh, can result in violence from non or from market participants rather than from the state itself. So with respect to price controls, uh, you have a situation where some people in the economy are harmed and where very often some people can benefit. Others are surprisingly harmed. Okay, so people who expect to benefit from certain price controls, say for example, low income people, there's a price control on milk, uh, milk is in short supply, and the result being that people 
don't have access to milk at all. So rather than helping them, it unintentionally or surprisingly hurts them. Of course, there's all sorts of distortions caused by price controls, and this also leads to um, taxes and, and bureaucracy as well. So that also is going to fit in with uh, uh, the uh, what's it <laughs> binary intervention. Excuse me. And also, uh, it's important to note that uh, price controls uh, can have effects on the product, and product controls, which we're going to look at next, are obviously can have price uh, impacts on the price of products. The first kind of product control is prohibition. Here, both the suppliers and the demanders are hurt by the prohibition, whereas in price controls, you can have nominal winners, either on the supply side or the demand side. With prohibition, you have basically have all parties in the market harmed as a result of prohibition. The only people that are benefited are the bureaucrats and the interest groups that want to promote certain types of prohibition. So an alcohol prohibition, for example, uh, will help establish and fund an alcohol bureaucracy, but it will also help politicians who are um, conveying favors to uh, people who believe in alcohol temperance uh, and not drinking alcohol. Of course, prohibition, it's the most important impact, is in creating a black market where there are more risks, there are higher prices, and a lot of inefficiency. And then Rothbard goes through and looks at all of the other impacts that prohibition brings about. It, it distorts the type of firm, it distorts and detracts the type of information that's available uh, to consumers. In fact, prohibition is, is an interesting contrast between neoclassical economists and Austrian economists. Uh, neoclassical economists are generally what they call price theorists, so that everything they do with respect to modeling and markets and supply and demand has to do with the price of the product. Austrians have a more general view of how government intervention affects marketplaces, businesses, and consumers. And when we look at prohibition, where you have the state imposing its will and enforcing it with criminal penalties, what we find is that the changes in the market that result from a prohibition, the price changes are actually the least important in the overall scope of things. So when neoclassicals look at the problem of prohibition, they try to model it in terms of price. It raises the price for them, it decreases the quantity, and so therefore it in some sense achieves its desired result. It doesn't achieve complete prohibition, but at least it reduces consumption. Now the Austrians are going to look at that and say, well, you know, look at what other changes are happening. The product is produced in an entirely different way. It's uh, transported under completely different conditions. It's sold under completely different conditions, and it's consumed under completely different co conditions. People don't have access to uh, the rule of law. People aren't protected by laws against fraud. They aren't protected um, by the normal channels of competition. One of the things that I've shown is that <clears throat> prohibition results in much higher potent drugs being sold into the marketplace. So that the neoclassicals can say, well, we've decreased the quantity of drugs sold by prohibition. The problem is, is that the quantity that's been sold is many times more potent than that which would have been sold in the marketplace. So before prohibition, things like cocaine and heroin, um, morphine, uh, were relatively safe. And very few people uh, died from those products. They, very few people overdosed from those products because they were produced and distributed and consumed under market conditions. 
But now we have uh, a completely different situation where it's, the products are being produced, uh, they're being distributed, and they're being consumed under completely different conditions. And a lot of people die. Uh, a lot of people experience overdoses. And all of that is directly uh, attributable to the prohibition itself. There was just a little news item on CNN on my way over here, which um, showed that the potency of marijuana is higher now than it ever has been in the history of man, basically. And it's been consistently higher over the last 30 years that the government has been testing uh, the potency of, of marijuana, which might be uh, some kind of explanation for their uh, behavior over recent years as well. Now, there's a whole long list of different types of product controls that grant monopoly privileges in the economy. And again, Rothbard uh, shows here that consumers and would-be or potential producers are harmed as a result of these uh, product controls and that very often these product controls and grants of monopoly privilege result in higher prices for consumers, and he also points out, which is very important, that many of these monopoly privileges are sugar-coated with grants of um, appearing to serve the public interest uh, in order to make them more palatable to consumers. And again, these are areas where it's very difficult for consumers to understand what's happening to them, uh, especially given this sugar-coating that the monopoly privileges are uh, meant to improve the public image. Okay, he starts out with compulsory cartels. Um, next is licenses and certificates of need. Uh, of course, there's many, many different professions, such as doctors who are given licenses. Uh, certificates of needs apply to things like establishing new hospitals, new nursing homes, things of that nature. These all serve to increase the price of the product. Standards of quality, uh, this obviously uh, is cloaked in the public interest. Uh, the medical profession uh, is important with this regard. The imposition of product definitions and ingredient labeling are all done to uh, establish so-called standards of quality. Uh, interesting one that just came about recently uh, where the uh, government required uh, food products to label the amount of a certain type of fat. Um, trans fats. Yeah, trans fats. Um, well, it turns out that at the same time they required anybody who had trans fats in their food to label it, they also allowed uh, producers to include up to one gram per serving of trans fats and declare that there was no trans fats in the food, while at the same time allowing the producers to change the amount that fit with um, a unit of consumption. So a product will, you know, a bag of potato chips will say, this has four servings of potato chips, and it's, you know, so many chips and uh, so many calories and all that. They allowed them to change that so that producers would reduce the amount in a serving, increase the number of servings, so that on the product labeling, the calories per serving went down, and the amount of trans fats would fall below the one gram per serving. So instead of sending out the message that um, we're going to get tough on trans fats, what they effectively did was give a avenue for producers, and I'm all for trans fats, by the way. I'm not you know, being anti-trans fat here, um, to declare on their product that this product is trans fat free. So you've seen a plethora of these, these new labeling uh, techniques when, in fact, the product is the same old thing 
that it's always been. The labeling has been changed. And so, you know, this is not a, uh, not a fraud. It's just a way in which industry has captured the state to its own advantage in order to hurt consumers. And, of course, so much for uh, building construction regulations with the uh, construction towers in New York, you know, falling on a regular basis and killing people, as, as Walter would point out, um, you know, that type of activity is severely restricted in a true free market economy, but because these construction companies is, have complied with regulations and inspections, uh, they're able to get off uh, with lower penalties. Uh, tariffs, uh, obviously, is an important one where it's a battle basically between mercantilist arguments and free market arguments. Immigration restrictions, uh, Rothbard shows um, how the free society works in terms of immigration and wage rate um, compensation differentials where uh, capital moves uh, from high-wage to low-wage countries and where low-wage workers move to high-wage countries or high-capital countries, um, which uh, basically, if we didn't have the national borders and, and have the distortions that we uh, currently have, uh, things like population problems, labor shortages, and the like would, uh, would not emerge at all. Child labor laws um, cause unemployment, less production. Uh, conscription is, is another big one, especially at the time that Rothbard was writing this. During the Vietnam or pre-Vietnam era, World War, post-World War II. The minimum wage law is a good example where the uh, minimum wage law actually hurts those that it is designed to help. Subsidies to unemployment, penalties to market forms. Uh, that was a bigger issue in the 1950s and the 1960s than it is today, but we still think, see things um, like a tax on Walmart. State of Maryland passed a law uh, with regard to how firms would handle uh, health insurance for the employees, and it turned out that that law only applied to one super Walmart in the state of Maryland. Antitrust laws fit into this, um, again, where it's seemingly designed to help competition, it actually hurts competition. Conservation laws. Uh, Murray goes into great depth with conservation laws. Of course, we refer to them as environmental laws today. The uh, greatest pie in the sky type of legislation uh, that um, is in the market today. Environmental laws or conservation laws, Rothbard shows, is a misuse of resources in an economic sense. Uh, he shows that owners of private property uh, create the maximum present value of their resources and are in the best place to conserve those resources. And one thing that I find very enlightening uh, in terms of teaching classes about conservation or environmental laws is to ask students the difference between renewable resources and non-renewable resources. In other words, resources which the world has the ability to produce over and over, we can change, we can get less of them, we can get more of them, but all we have to do is continue the production process of providing enough ground or enough food or enough air or whatever, and we'll be able to constantly reproduce those particular resources forever. And then there's the non-renewable resources where there's a fixed finite amount of those particular products on Earth, and once we use them up, they're going to be gone forever. And then I asked the students, which one, which one of these sets of resources, the renewable or the non-renewable, do we face the most problem with? And they inevitably pick the non-renewable resources, those which are finite, they're fixed. If we use them up, it's all gone. 
but the renewable ones we shouldn't have much problem with. But in fact, it's the renewable resources which we're having the most problems with, uh, according to the environmentalist groups themselves. Okay, particular plant species, particular animal species, particular fish species, whereas things like gold, for example, doesn't look like you know we're having much of a problem with that. Uh, even things like uranium, which has a sort of a shelf life to it, you know that stuff is stored and and then reprocessed into other products, um, uh, and so we're actually having very little problems with these exhaustible resources, and we're having all of the problems with the inexhaustible resources that are renewable. And why is that? Well, with the non-renewable resources, they tend to be in private hands. Okay? They tend to be owned by individuals, people who own land, people who own mines and mine resources. Whereas with the renewable resources, those are things that are not subject to property rights very often, or where the government actually gets in the way of establishing property rights, like in the sea or in bodies of water. And so that's a great example of how the market with property rights actually takes very good care of resources, whereas where the government either hasn't is either has gotten in the way of or has uh, stymied the establishment of property rights. Now, patents um, are an important invasion of property rights by the state. It's an invasion of the property rights of the would-be inventors, um, people who come along and, and discover um, of a second discoverers of various techniques. And I think the group basically um, understands a lot about uh, the impact of, of patents, although I know there are questions about it. I want to give you a, personal, um, ex a couple of personal experiences with inventions. Um, I suffer from uh, allergies, pollen allergies, and... Uh, one weekend this spring I woke up and I thought I had this great idea that if I could only come up with a nose filter where I could stick it in my nose and have a, you know, one of those high quality filters put in there, that I could go outside uh, instead of wearing one of those big Michael Jackson masks, uh, which, you know, it makes people afraid of you. Um, but, you know, just a little nose plug, I figured, well, they'll just think I'm a geek. And so I designed this thing and, and got, you know, what I would need to have, you know, little plastic pieces and filters and so on. And I thought, well, the filters would have to be replaceable, uh, given that it's in your nose all the time. And so I laid all this out, and then I went on the Internet to see if anybody else had discovered this. And you're thinking, what is he trying to do? You know, why would he be coming up with this kind of invention? Well, it turns out, that three other people already have patents on this. And then there's a couple more who have patents pending. Uh, but none of them are in the marketplace. Those people have been, came up with this idea, and they're just in the way, sort of, of other people trying to bring it to market. Because if I brought it to market, they would, you know, sue to recoup all my profits. And because there's multiple patents already existing, uh, if anybody did try to bring it to market uh, with permission, they probably have to get permission and, and give fees to all of the uh, patent owners. Uh, I also uh, came up with another invention, again for the uh, the allergies, uh, where I took a 3M filtrate filter. Um, if you have an air conditioning unit in your home or in your apartment, there's a filter attached to it. And if you don't have one, I'll show it to you. Um, they're all around the Institute. Um, and so I took these, the 3M filter and duct taped it to a 20-inch box fan. And then you just run the fan, and it brings the air through, and it takes all the pollen out of the air. 
And so not wanting to profit from this myself, I sent the idea to the 3M company, who also makes the masks and the filtrate filter, so that was the natural company to send it to. And sure enough, about 18 months later, they came out with a very fancy version of my Thornton Air machine. <laughs> and I was kind of indignant that, um, that the first time I found out about this was when they sent me an advertisement to buy one of these things, costing $200. Um, and, you know, I was going to write this company and call them up and, and give them a piece of my mind, but somebody said, you know, somebody told me, they said, if they had even sent you a letter of thanks, that would have been evidence that, that I could have presented in a court lawsuit against them um, in order to, you know, make my patent claim um, on that product. So patents really affect, distort, uh, and reduce overall economic research, uh, overall product research, and in particular, they prevent uh, the bringing of that basic research, that primary introductory type research, into the market in, in terms of products actually reaching the market. And there's a whole host of, um, of other such interventions that Rothbard covers, and that's another good um, benefit of power and market uh, or the final sections of man, economy, and state is that you get a shorthand introduction to all of the really important aspects of a problem. You might not go into a lot of the details, but it'll say the consumers are hurt, would-be producers are hurt, special interest groups, groups are helped. And so there's uh, government franchises like the post office and the state lottery, uh, the problem of eminent domain, which really probably cries out for an Austrian treatment, sort of a law and economics dissertation or thesis on that subject, uh, bribery, Anti-monopoly policy, which of course Rothbard shows anti-monopoly policy is actually uh, helps create monopoly uh, and restrictive prices. And then the appendix look at private coinage and coercion. Again, some uh, very interesting topics. And before opening it up, I want to um, try to address or at least introduce some of the written questions here. By the way, when I started getting into Austrian economics, um, I had a couple of books. I know I had uh, Kirzner's um, book on competition, but one of the first books I ever got was Power and Market. And uh, that was one I most completely uh, read and digested of the early books on Austrian economics, but I had no idea that there was this whole huge prelude um, of man, economy, and state. For that, so I just I read um, I had some economic courses, some introductory economic courses, but um, I was uh, basically taking a lot of what Rothbard said either on tuition or faith. But it was a it was a great eye opener for me. Okay, I know that the classification of types of intervention and in complex analysis is great uh, in Rothbard. But just a short question, what is his original contribution in this area? Well, um, I think one is the topology itself, is, is laying out the system, uh, the classifications, uh, and giving you the full feel of the entire scope of intervention and the, the vast different varieties of intervention that the state makes uh, in economy. So I'd say that was the primary uh, contribution, but a lot of these specific interventions are are not treated uh, anywhere else uh, in the literature at, uh, as of the time that it was first published. Second question: I'm not convinced by Rothbard's argument that the major purpose of standard of quality and safety regulations is to restrict competition, and of course that's um, exactly what the state wants people to think, and that's the uh, specific aspect of uh, quality and safety regulations that are most promoted uh, by the state. But we should note that in the market economy that there are a lot of uh, very reasonable 
and in fact more effective forms of safety and quality regulations. There's some specific ones like the certification process. Doctors need to be licensed, but other medical professions and other professions, other services can be certified. So that you're a certified whatever. Um, and that just says that you've been specifically trained in a service, that you've uh, met all the qualifications, uh, you've had all the teaching, all the uh, hands-on experience. And so that's a very legitimate uh, alternative to the licensing uh, process. And actually, um, licensing is, is somewhat suspect with respect to uh, standards of quality. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of beauticians and people who cut hair and that sort of thing, um, the actual requirements to get a license um, are not really heavily slated towards the cutting of hair and those sorts of things. They're actually related to things that are not directly related to the business of cutting and styling hair. But they do form um, a barrier to entry because they keep people out of the profession um, people, for example, who don't have a great profic proficiency with the English language uh, won't pass the licensing test. There are various, various seals of approval, the Good Housekeeping Seal of Approval, uh, the National Association of Retired People um, passed their seal of approval over a variety of uh, pro products specifically designed for their members. Um, there's groups like Underwriters Laboratory. You very often see electronic products in your apartments uh, with a U and an L with a circle around it. And that may, means that um, the electronic components of this product have been uh, inspected and certified by the Underwriters Laboratory. And then, of course, there's a whole bunch of market competitive forces which keep businesses uh, providing safe, uh, and high quality products. I also do, do not agree with Rothbard's dismissal of national borders as something warranty, warranting special attention. For instance, to name one difference, domestic borders and national borders usually dif differ in that the latter involves language barriers. Furthermore, I believe that if people believe that there is such a thing as a nation, then this will affect their actions and thus it is worthy of attention. I find that Rothbard tends to oversimplify this matter too much. Well, I would say that in this chapter, with respect to this chapter, he's downplaying the role of national borders to explain some theoretical elements of these issues, such as the immigration problem, uh, such as the tariff, the problems with tariffs. But I don't think that Rothbard would dismiss uh, the issue of national borders uh, in general at all. On page uh, 1098, do quality standards actually prohibit change or merely make it more costly? If the government prohibits the sale of computers with less than two gigs of RAM, any new technology for computer memory would have to be in addition to the old RAM technology, but it would still be possible, correct? Well, it, it certainly would be possible, uh, but there also could be uh, various types of uh, drawbacks to uh, such a quality standard, in this case, setting a minimum of two gigs of RAM. For example, there are a lot of people who are interested in, in buying very low-priced Computers. As a matter of fact, there's a whole movement to provide every child in the world with a low-priced computer. Whether or not they have access to the Internet or electricity or anything like that um, is beside the point. They just want low-cost computers in everybody's hands. But this type of requirement would actually hinder that potential, greatly hinder it. For example, two gig um, memory chips um, are already in high demand, but the smaller chips are in less demand, and so you can actually acquire them and construct lower-priced computers. 
it might also, uh, such technological regulation might also um, curtail the ability of the computer making industry to switch from one technology to another. If Rothbard would have uh, had, excuse me, if Rothbard would have land to be free for the taking by those who mixed their labor with the land, how was it that the subsidy uh, to grant right of ways to railroads isn't the policy of reserving timberlands from the market more of a burden on others who must pay the restrictiveness, restrictiveness price than a subsidy to railroads, at least with respect to the right of way, as opposed to the lands reserved on the sides of the way. Um, well, I think Rothbard in particular would be uh, against uh, the subsidy, the giveaway of rights away on both sides of the 15 miles on both sides of the right away. Um, the intercontinental railroads were um, a giant scam, a, a big uh, waste of resources, uh, and that other ways, uh, homesteading ways, could have very easily sufficed. I mean, if a railroad sent out a survey crew and put down survey markers along uh, a particular route, that would have established their property rights um, to the entire route um, from the from the Midwest over to the West Coast. So I think that home study would have uh, fulfilled that uh, need uh, with with good ease, uh, and that the way we did it ended up causing a very inefficient building of the railroads um, and a fairly big waste of resources. And we can come back to all these questions if you want. To what extent are graphical representation, in this case the price controls, logically sound? The reasoning underlying them certainly is, but can a supply and demand curve be said to prove anything about price controls? That is, prove anything in the sense uh, that logical argumentation does. In other words, are graphical representations aptodictically or only tautologically true? Well, in my own view, graphs um, with supply and demand curves are simply a way of conveying information, a, a pedagogy, a pedagogical device, rather than anything that's apodictically certain or tautologically true. Um, they're just a um, easier way than trying to actually draw out individual supply and demand curves and adding up the entire market and coming up with something less than a smooth line. You may have some disagreements on that one. And then finally, what are some examples of more recent, in the past 10 years or 20 years, of triangular intervention? Well, you know, a lot of the triangular interventions are things that already exist, uh, but if we go back to 20 or 30 years, we have the... Uh, uh, a variety of different things. I imagine we could pass around a, a, some paper and pen here and, and come up with uh, 100 or so. Uh, there's the No Child Left Behind uh, legislation in the, within the last five or six years. Uh, the ethanol subsidy program. Uh, American with uh, Disability Act, which is I think about 20 years old. The Prescription Drug Act. Uh, major legislation increasing the uh, power of the Federal Emergency Management Association. There's the Patriot Act. There's um, cap and trade. Uh, the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol, which the United States hasn't signed, but certainly could be studied. Um, and just a large variety of environmental and business regulation um, type of interventions that have been introduced. And then, of course, um, Austrians also like to focus in on uh, aspects of deregulation and privatization, which also would come under the rubric of triangular uh, intervention. So there's, a, there's really a whole host of different types of triangular intervention and many new ones. The second part of this question is, why can't sound economic analysis prevail in showing the contradictory and harmful effects of government intervention 
into the marketplace? Well, I think it can, um, and I think it does. Uh, the real problem is in conveying that to the general population at large.